let me start this webinar. Thanks uh, very much for uh, joining and thanks very much to Marco for uh, agreeing to um, participate in our webinar series. Mm, so I'm Diana, I'm a principal expert at Skylight and I'll moderate this session. Um, I have a strong background in immunology and immunotherapy and uh, I think that's what brought me to Marco at one of our first in-person conferences last year in France. Let me shortly introduce Skylight first. Um, so Skylight um, it was founded 2017 uh, as a spin-off of the ETH Zurich and is based at the moment in Basel in the Novartis Swiss Innovation Park. Skylight has a proprietary platform called SkyVision, a neural network-based algorithm that gains clinically relevant insights from high parametric data, such as uh, single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, Mark will share some of his experience with that today. Uh, and we leverage SkyVision, our uh, algorithm, to discover and develop biomarkers in complex medical uh, indications and therapeutic approaches, such as oncology and immunology, immunotherapy, and uh, cell therapy. And uh, this is uh, Marco's specialty. Uh, so in this context, I met, uh, I met him uh, in a conference last year and he impressed me not only with his position in, at the forefront of cell therapy in the University of Pennsylvania, but also with his innovative and uh, thorough approach to CAR T cells to address clinically relevant unmet needs in the field. So today we are very honored to host uh, Professor Ruela uh, for our webinar series. Um, and while being an assistant professor at the medicine, uh, of medicine at the hospital of uh, the University of Pennsylvania, he also became a scientific advisor of our board of directors at Skylight. So Dr. Uh, Ruela's laboratory focuses on the mechanisms of relapse after CAR T cell therapies. And he obtained his medical degree and specialization uh, in clinical hematology at the University of Torino in Italy. And he was also attending physician at the hematology and uh, cell therapy division of the Ma Mauriziano Hospital and was an instructor at the biotechnology school at the University of Torino. And I guess uh, this brought him and uh, motivated him to do, as he told me, a very short postdoc in the States uh, at the lab of uh, Carol June, the father of CAR T cells, and I guess uh, he just couldn't leave anymore and stay there for the last 10 years. Um, so from 2017 to 2018, he served as associate director of uh, uh, Carol June's lab. And 2018, he was appointed assistant professor of medicine in the division of hematology and oncology and the center of cellular immunotherapies. Like this is really the leading uh, institution for CAR T cell therapies. Uh, and became a scientific director of the lymphoma program at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So we are really proud to have him also as our scientific advisor, as a specialist in the field. Uh, he was awarded so many awards, it will take me another five minutes to list them all. So I'll just uh, give the field uh, to him now to present his cutting edge research in uh, CAR T cells and how he applies uh, innovative technologies such as single cell sequencing to advance the field. Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dan Diana, for the, the very kind introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be presenting at this webinar. And thank you to, to Skylight for organizing this interesting series of seminars um, on, on, on very important topics, such as resistance to immunotherapy and how can we understand more about how to overcome this mechanism. So uh, these are my um, uh, disclosures and uh, conflicts of interest. So I, I wanted to get started uh, with just a general slide on what chimeric antigen receptor T cells are. I'm sure the audience of this webinar is in uh, 2022 quite familiar with the concept. But just as a quick review, the, the main concept that was developed um, initially in, um, in Israel and Japan in the end of the 80s and and then really brought to fruition in the US by several centers, including the University of Pennsylvania, includes the genetic engineering of, of T cells. So T cells are taken from patients with uh, um, cancer. Um, at Penn, we use lentiviral vector to transduce the T cells and make them express in the car. And in the next slide, I will show you what this car or chimeric antigen receptor is. And now these T cells that are ex vivo modified 
with the car are then infused back to patients and now they would be able to go around the body, recognize CD19, uh, for example, which is a B-cell lymphoma, B-cell leukemia marker, and kill the tumor cells. And so this is, of course, is a, is a conceptual cartoon, but I think it's important to see how, how actually CAR T cell work in reality. And so this nice video that was developed by a colleague of ours at Penn shows a CAR T cell here that engages two leukemic cells. In this case, these are two B acute lymphoblastic leukemia cells that are green because they were trans transduced with GFP. And what you can see here that the CAR T cell is able to establish a synapse with the tumor, and then rapidly after that, the, the two leukemic cells start uh, dying. And you see these blebs, that means that the cells are undergoing apoptosis. And as you may imagine, this T cell then can go and find other leukemic cells and, and kill them as well. Um, so I mentioned to you that the, the, the key innovation of this platform is the use of a chimeric antigen receptor. So a chimeric antigen receptor is a fusion protein. You can see here the initial uh, so-called first generation CAR that um, starts from the brilliant idea of fusing a monoclonal antibody with a T cell receptor. In particular, the antigen recognizing domain of an antibody uh, in the form of a single chain variable fragment that you can see here with the CD3 zeta signaling domain of the T cell receptor. And so, as you may imagine, a T cell that is transduced with such a construct will be able to recognize an antigen as a monoclonal antibody and get stimulated as it were stimulated through the T cell receptor. So this is the first generation conceptualized, as I mentioned, in the late 80s. Um, now, really, the ones that have been successful in the clinics are called second generation CAR, similar structure, with the difference that now we have co-stimulatory domains. I'm showing you here 4-1-BB, but also CD28 is very popular among the um, uh, clinical products. And of course, now with the co-stimulatory domain, you get both signal one through the CD3 zeta and signal two through 4-1-BB. So how is this done in the clinic? So this is really the first uh, manufacturing uh, protocol that was um, developed a pen and then brought to approval by Novartis. And that includes the leukapheresis of uh, the T cell from a patient, for example, with lymphoma. Um, the leukapheresis is allowed to collect the white blood cells. Now these white blood cells are then stimulated with anti-CD3, CD28 uh, antibody coded beads that activate them. And uh, 24 hours later, the lentiviral um, vector is added. And over time, the T cell expands, start to express the car. And then before freezing, the beads are removed. And now the product is frozen and ready to be infused to patient. Typically, before infusion back to patient, patient receive chemotherapy. It's called lymphodepletion. That allows the creation of the right environment for the car T cell to engraft and expand in the body. As I said, everything started 30 years ago with the development of the car. Then 30 years later, we have several products that have been approved um, in the clinic. And I think uh, we want to stress that the first product is Kimraya or Tizagen Ducluzel that was developed um, at Penn uh, and, uh, and then brought to approval by Novartis. And after that, um, Yescara was approved. This is a CD28 co-stimulatory domain for lymphoma. And then many other products have been approved uh, for uh, lymphoma, leukemia, and most recently for multiple myeloma. You can see all of that. And why? what is the reason of this uh, very exciting success? Well, um, I, think, I think that the main reason is because they work. The main reason is because they were able to bring patients that uh, had progressive disease to a complete response. And I want to show just a couple of examples. Uh, one in B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which was the first indication in, in the kids. And this was led by the group at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. You can see that before or uh, at baseline, this patient had a lot of leukemic cells identified as CD20, CD19 positive in the mom marrow. Day 23, so um, a little bit over three weeks after infusion, 
the leukemic cells are gone. Interestingly, at the same time, you can see that um, the CAR T cells in the bone marrow over time proliferate, and now they account for over 70% of the, of the bone marrow cells, really indicating that this is a live drug that uh, is able to get to the tissue where uh, the leukemia is, kill the leukemic cells, but at the same time expanding and taking over and, and, and basically being able to, to clear leukemic cell very uh, deeply. So this was pediatric leukemia. Another important example that led to approval is B-cell lymphoma. You can see here an example, a patient with extensive disease in the lymph node, in the armpit, in the neck, as you can see here. Um, a month later, uh, those nodes are done and the patient is in complete response. So very exciting results um, of this therapy. One shot, one single infusion, and many patients are in complete response at long term. There are some, I think, extraordinary examples that I want to share with you because really speak, uh, these examples speak of the um, extreme potency of this approach. One of them is certainly the story of Emily Whitehead. Emily Whitehead is celebrating now 10 years uh, cancer free. She uh, was a, a young kid with uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia that relapsed many, many uh, uh, cycles of chemotherapy and transplant. She was the first kid receiving CAR T cells. She got very sick, but luckily the, the, the physician at the Children's Hospital and the University of Pennsylvania were able to, um, uh, to, to control the toxicity. And now she's 10 years without leukemia. One single shot 10 years ago, she still has CAR T cells circulating in her body. Another important example is in, in the adult setting. Again, um, about 10 years ago, a series of patients were treated um, with CAR-19. These are patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And now, um, uh, for example, this patient is, has been 10 years without leukemia. And uh, as you can see, this is, of course, it's very important because it speaks about the, the fact that these responses can be maintained at long term. But I think the reason why I, I'm here and the reason why I didn't shut down my, my laboratory is, is because unfortunately, um, if we look at the results at long term, the majority of patients still do not benefit from this treatment. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look, for example, at two um, FDA approved indications, diffuse abyssal lymphoma and follicular lymphoma um, with, the, with Steve Schuster, at, at, at Penn, we, we look at the long-term responses of these patients. And the good news is that about a third of patients are without disease at five years, which I think we can consider them cured. But we also need to recognize that the other two thirds, uh, for some reason, didn't make it to five years. They had uh, disease progression. And similarly for follicular lymphoma, a little bit higher responses. And if we look at the two key studies, and this is for Tisagen Lucluso, so the, the 41BB uh, Novartis product, um, the two FDA approval, uh, the two first FDA approval show that absolutely there is an excellent event-free survival, progression-free survival of an infusion for patients with lapsed refractory disease. However, again, if you look at the yellow area, the area above the curve in this case, you see that really the majority of patients either uh, have a lack of response, which is higher actually in lymphoma as compared to pediatric leukemia, but some of them do relapse in leukemia and also some of them relapse in, in lymphoma. So I think there is a lot of interest to study more what are the resistant mechanisms uh, for this treatment now that we have a lot of patient treated and, and that will allow us to develop novel effective approaches. And so um, a few months ago, actually it's about a year ago or so, we uh, published this review paper that was really looking at the interaction between tumor cell and CAR T cell and trying to understand what are the mechanisms that are leading to failure of CAR immunotherapy. And I, I always like to start by highlighting that there are pre-infusion barriers. So these are um, reasons uh, by which um, we are not able to treat patients with, with CAR T cell therapy. For example, patients that have a, a very low lymphocyte counts, we cannot get enough cells to make a product. 
some manufacturing still fail. Or, and this is a very important reason, some patients progress during manufacturing. So they have such an aggressive disease that they, they, don't, they, they, they just progress while we're preparing the CAR T cell. And an important point, especially if we think about um, uh, public health care system, um, the high cost can, can be an issue. But if we look at the more biological reason for failure, I, I like to divide them in uh, uh, issues related to T cell dysfunction. So the CAR T cell that we infuse are not um, very functional. For example, they are exhausted or they are terminally differentiated. So they have not that sort of a naive or central memory phenotype that we like. The tumor microenvironment uh, can uh, be a, a serious issue for CAR T cell therapy, especially in um, tumors with masses, can be either lymphoma or solid cancers, but also tumor intrinsic mechanism. This means that uh, tumor cells have, strategy, have devised strategies to avoid recognition by CAR T cell, and certainly the most common one is antigen loss. So how can we study this mechanism of relapse to a detail that will allow us to really understand what's going on. And so uh, what, what is our sort of raw material that uh, we work with? Well, we're lucky enough to be able now to have a series of biopsies from patients that are treated with, uh, with CAR T cell. I like to think about harvesting um, gems, um, or very valuable um, stones from, from our patients. And so we, get, we can get blood, we can get tissues. And historical, what, historically, what we have been doing with, uh, with these samples is sort of to take these very valuable uh, materials and grind them and get sort of sand or grit or something like that. And this was what, what, was, what is called bulk RNA seq. You certainly get a lot of important information, but everything is mixed. So you're not able to understand at single cell level uh, what's going on in, in that sample. And in the last few years instead, we, we were really able to uh, have several single cell RNA sequencing platforms that were developed. And they are very exciting because they allow us to, to take those very precious stones and analyze them one by one. And so now you can study um, each, each of these um, uh, single cell with uh, precision. And so um, in, um, again, about a um, uh, few years ago, I think one of the most popular technologies that have been uh, used and is still probably the most used technology is to, to uh, harvest single cell and, and, and um, use uh, basically gel beads to, to perform the, um, the uh, reverse transcription and get the, the CDN, cDNA for um, the analysis. And I just wanted to, to show you a snapshot of uh, how that works. Um, a tissue can be harvested, can be bone marrow, can be blood. In this case, skin is just an example, um, a single cell a suspension is prepared. You can even now use antibodies um, or dyes to purify those cells. Um, and then you run them through the machine that will uh, basically perform what is shown here. Um, there are barcoded beads um, that are used to uh, bring uh, material in close contact to the cell. And as you can see here through the uh, microfluidics, you have the cells that are then encapsulated in a droplet that contains a gel bead and the um, uh, cell. And in this droplet, the reaction happens and gives the uh, specific cDNA for each cell with the proper barcoding that will allow us to recognize that that's coming from a specific uh, cell. And so we, we try to summarize with, um, with our, a PhD student in, uh, in my lab, uh, what are the key results of single cell RNA sequencing in uh, cancer immunotherapy? And of course, there would be a lot of topics to, to discuss, but I think this is a slide that really shows what are the major findings that have been found. 
And of course, you know, as you can see here, you can now focus on different cellular subset within the tumor microenvironment. So just to give you a couple of example, um, this technology has been applied to CAR T cells, uh, for example, identifying dominant clones that are characterized by higher toxicity and proliferation. Balcarinate, we would just see everything together. So we won't be able to identify subset of, of CAR T cells that are particularly affected. Or um, in other settings like checkpoint inhibitors, uh, CD4 positive, CD8 positive cells have been identified with specific signature for some of the um, T cell that would expand over checkpoint therapy, but also other cells that are um, commonly known to be immunosuppressive have been studied. Macrophages, myeloderived suppressor cells or regulatory T cells. Now we can focus on these specific subsets and, and study what is their role during immunotherapy. So I, I want to show you just a snapshot on these cell types to show you what we have learned so far in, in CAR T cell immunotherapy. And just one, um, one point that I wanted to make, I think to make it easier, I will, I'd like to start by focusing on different players in the, in the tumor microenvironment. One is the effector T cell, of course, so these are the T cells that recognize cancers and are supposed to kill cancer cells. Cancer cells themselves, so you can focus and gate on clusters of cancer cells and study them. Or broadly speaking, the tumor microenvironment. So these are the cells that typically are immunosuppressive and they can also be studied um, with precision using single cell technologies. Starting with effector T cells, um, in 2020, we published this paper where we were looking at the uh, role of the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis in resistant to CAR T cell therapy. So what we discovered, and you can see here to the left, is that patients that had a not lack of response, so as I mentioned you earlier, there is a, about 15, 20% of patients in the pediatric setting that would not respond at day 28. And so what we discovered is that those patients, those patients with lack of response, as you can see here, they have much lower expression of pro-apoptotic factors in the leukemic cells. So now we're focusing um, in the leukemic cells here. And this was by bulk RNA because we just had stored samples um, to analyze. And so these are all the factors and the signature that we we define of pro-apoptotic factor. And if you, if you build a, um, a signature on, on the death receptor, so extrinsic pathway, you can identify patients with a high score that go very well. This is the overall survival after CAR T cell therapy. And these are the patients with low score. But again, I mentioned now we, we are interested in, in the T cell function. And um, what was interesting to see is that we noticed that in patients with a high score, the T cell were working much better, higher expansion, higher persistence. Why with the low score? So in those patients that were resistance, resistant to apoptosis, the T cell were overall dysfunctional, low expansion and low persistence. And so that indicated that when T cell tried to kill a leukemic cell that cannot die, they become over time dysfunctional. And so what um, did we do to try to study more T cells? Well, we, uh, we work with the children's hospital and we, were, we got access to cases um, um, of CAR T cell patients that were either responders or non-responders to um, CAR T cell therapy. And what we analyzed, we analyzed the uh, T cells in the peripheral blood, uh, and in particular the, um, the CAR T cells at the peak of expansion. And interestingly, you see that the non-responder patients has a very high uh, scoring that you can see here for exhaustion. These are the factors that we identify for exhaustion, indicating that T cell exhaustion can really be one of the reasons why this patient fail and they will display not response at day 28. And interestingly, using again single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, those that specifically this cluster that we identified to be dysfunctional was not present at, in the infusion product. 
So in other words, if you look at responders here and non-responders, you cannot really identify any um, exhausted cluster in either of them. But these clusters sort of start to develop exhaustion when they are infusing to patient and they start um, to kill, they try to kill the leukemic cell. So this, for example, is an application of single cell DNA sequencing to identify clusters that are characterized by exhaustion in, uh, in, uh, in patients with treated with CAR-19. Another, I think, important example that we see here, this was, uh, this is a paper um, from uh, the laboratory of Dr. Karjun at Penn. Um, so what uh, we initially did with a postdoc in the Jun's lab is to develop a system where we, you can co-culture your CAR T cells with tumor cells for prolonged um, amount of time. And it's called CAE, so continuous antigen exposure. And you can see that at baseline, the CAR T cell look like this. So they have three main clusters. At day 20, after being exposed to antigen, in this case was a mesothelin CAR and so mesothelin positive tumors, now you have different clusters. And interestingly, some of these clusters, in particular these two here, um, one and four, were characterized by, and you can see here the details, were characterized by a, a profile, at a, a single cell RNA sequencing that um, um, was considered dysfunctional. And interestingly, what, um, what the, uh, the uh, Charlie, Shunichiro, and Angela in the, in the Jun's lab and Berger lab, what they showed is that um, this cluster, and in particular cluster one, was getting a uh, NKT type phenotyping. So basically over time, the CAR T cell were becoming more like an NK cell, and that led to um, sort of uh, their uh, dysfunctional state. And you can see in this volcano plot, these are the, the genes that are upregulated in the dysfunctional, um, in the dysfunctional CAR T cells. Again, differences that would otherwise not be seen because if you analyze all of them together, you don't get this granularity where you can focus on the, on the cluster that is dysfunctional. Another important paper, uh, this is not from, from the group at Penn, but from the group at um, MD Anderson, the group of Michael Green. What they did, they used single cell uh, sequencing to analyze CAR T cell infusion product from Yescara. So this is the, um, this is the product that uh, axis cell that contains a CD28 because similar to domain. And they used the Tenex genomics platform. They, they took the cells from the bag, um, the leftover single cell, and they correlated the single cell data with the clinical parameters. And, and also they used circulating uh, tumor DNA. And in this case, they used this CAP ID plus. It's, it's a platform, it's a pipeline that they developed to, to focus on specific um, uh, transcripts. And so what they found, and this is just a snapshot, you can take a look at the paper. <clears throat> what they found here is that patients, and this is similar to what we published earlier and they show you, they showed the patient with um, progressive disease or partial response were enriched for exhaust T cells, especially the CD8 component. While interestingly, the ones that had a complete response, they had a more, more like a memory phenotype and so on. And you can see that um, if you look at the CD8 cells, now you have specific clusters that are enriched. For example, C4 has a very high complete response rate, while C1 is only 20% of response rate. So some of these clusters you can find more likely in patients that are not responding. In other clusters, you can find in patients that are responding. And again, with uh, bulk uh, sequencing technologies, it would have been unlikely to find these differences. And so I showed you some data on looking at uh, the CAR T cell themselves. But of course, also looking at cancer cell is important because it can really help us understanding uh, how they interact with T cells and, for example, identify which ones are the real cancer cell and which ones are instead normal counterpart cell. And this is work from, from my lab, um, work in, in, in progress. For example, you can take a lymphoma. This is a lymphoma biopsy. And within the lymphoma, you can identify several components of the microenvironment. 
in K cells, monocytes, dendritic cells, proliferating cells, and so on. And interestingly, what we found in this specific patient is that there were two clusters that were uh, called uh, B cells. And again, imagine if you do RNA sequencing of this biopsy, you would have all these different clusters together. So you would see the RNA sequencing of everything together. But in this case, even the B cells, we found two clusters. And so we said, okay, so this is a lymphoma. We're seeing two clusters. Why there are two clusters of B cells? And so something that is, is very exciting, then now you can also pair with the sequencing, the VDJ sequencing and looking at, at the B cell receptor or the T cell receptor clonality in the same uh, specimen. And interestingly, what we found is that there were dominant uh, BCRs within the, um, the sample that interestingly are only present this clonal BCR in one of the two um, B cell clusters. And so of course that led us, led us to think that this one was the tumor cluster and instead this one is the normal B cells. So you can imagine that in order to identify the genes related to this single um, uh, tumor population in this vast majority of tumor microbiome would have been very, very difficult. But now we can identify that by doing single cell and BCR sequencing. So we know this is the, the lymphoma cells so we can analyze them. And obviously, if you look at the RNA sequencing uh, and comparing normal B cell to lymphoma cells, they are very different. You can see, for example, uh, higher expression of several factors in, in the lymphoma cells and, and, um, and on, on the opposite side, there is reduced expression of other factors that, you know, we cannot go into the details right now. And of course, you can take those data and you can apply, for example, um, uh, gene ontology and look what are the pathways that are involved and, and get a sense of what are the main mechanisms that are driving those lymphoma cells as compared to normal B cells. And lastly, I want to touch on the tumor microenvironment. We um, were interested again in lymphoma, that's my bias for sure, but in particular, there is a, a form of lymphoma called Hodgkin lymphoma, which is by definition characterized by a huge presence of the tumor microenvironment. Uh, in fact, the tumor cells account for only one to 5% of the total number of cells. So the cancer cells are very, uh, the percentage is very, very small as compared to the tumor microenvironment. And obviously in the microenvironment, you find a lot of cells that are um, inhibitory to T cell function, Th2, Treg, macrophages, and so on. And so what we did in the lab was to use single cell to identify different populations in the tumor microenvironment of these lymphoma patients. And as you can see here, you can find many, many different clusters. You can see CD4 memory, CD4 naive, CD8, either even plasma cells and K cells and so on. And of course, you know, being interested in, um, in immunotherapy, um, we sort of wanted to see what was the impact of, of these cells on T cell functions. And so we use a um, control, healthy controls, to, to sort of highlight the key characteristic of Hodgkin lymphoma patients as compared to healthy patients. And, and you can see differences already uh, looking at the clusters, but um, what we did really wanted to do is to look at the interactions between the different groups of cells in the tumor microenvironment. And we use this platform, platform called CellPhoneDB that allows us to, to look uh, based on expression of rel in, in the relative clusters, what are the potential interactions um, of, of, of cells uh, uh, among each other. And what you can see here is in the normal lymph node, uh, this is the pattern of interaction. And here you can see that there is a much different pattern of interaction as compared to the normal lymph node. In particular, you see that um, CD4 Tdex, which are known to be uh, very inhibitory, have a strong interaction with uh, with CD8 cells. Indeed, uh, in fact, this is the highest interaction that you can see in the, in the Hodgkin lymphoma. And you can study here, for example, TGF-beta, 
for example, it's, it's highly enriching in this interaction. And we know that this is an important path. And there are other pathways, of course, that can be of interest. Then from the pen group, uh, again, this is a, um, a pen group and, and, um, and um, a collaboration with uh, the, the group at, at Stanford. You can see that um, they look at the issue of car neurotoxicity. And uh, uh, interestingly, they raise a sort of um, um, stimulating and uh, uh, hypothesis that they analyze the, the brain uh, single cells at single cell level using databases and they ask the question can be the neurotoxicity that we see with CAR T cell be related to the fact that CD19 is actually expressed in in the brain and uh, what they uh, what they suggest here and of course these data really need to be confirmed but I wanted to show this as a proof of concept of the potency of single cell but also the potency of the need for strong pipelines for analysis is that they hypothesize that CD19 is expressed in the brain in a subset of cells called pericytes. These are the cells that stay around the uh, vessels in, in the brain. And this is, for example, is a marker CD248. See, you can see pericytes express CD48, CD248, and they also express CD19, but they are not B cells because they don't express CD79A, which is a standard B cell marker. And so again, this raised the hypothesis that perhaps neurotoxicity or, or, or component of neurotoxicity might be related to the expression of CD19 in, in parasite. So to conclude, I, I would like to say that, again, we went from a um, pretty um, crude way of analyzing our tissues to now having uh, single cell platforms that allow us to select the, the, the single cell. But I think for um, the one of you that have been working with, with this type of data, sometimes it's really overwhelming the amount of information that you get. The, uh, there are many different ways that you can use to analyze samples um, and clusters, expression in each clusters. And now we will have attack seq we will have TCR, BCR sequencing. So I think we, uh, we are in a, in a good position where we have a lot of data coming in but we need strong um, uh, platforms to digest those data and really get to, to the core of the message. Otherwise, we, we can end up having, again, only sand and, and grid. All right, so again, I show you work from uh, a lot of groups at, at Penn and other institution. I'd like to thank everyone and, at the University of Pennsylvania. This was the, the day in 2017 when uh, we received the, the news that um, Tisagen Nucleusel was approved for uh, leukemia, being the first uh, product to be approved ever for, um, for cancer. Big celebration. You can see Karjun over here. Of course, I was not there. I was traveling um, in Europe, and so I decided to Photoshop myself here. So now I'm part of the, of the party. And again, thanks to my lab, uh, we... Uh, we are a growing lab at Penn, and we're always interested in, in, in hearing new postdoc and especially bioinformaticians to help uh, with other um, our studies. And thank to all of you. Thank you to um, uh, Skylight for the opportunity to present here. And I think we have time for um, a discussion. Um, and thank you again. Thank you very much, Marco. Yes, uh, so feel free to uh, pose your questions in our chat box. Um, and uh, maybe I can start with the first question while questions might accumulate. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation the different um, reasons for failure of CAR T cells, uh, starting with the pre-infusion uh, product, T cell dysfunction, tumor microenvironment. You've mentioned several of them. What mitigation measures in the clinic can be actually taken to um, address these issues uh, beyond academic research? Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question. So we, we are treating now hundreds of patients with CAR T-cell in the commercial setting. I show you that there are at least in the US six products. And the reality of the, of the fact is that um, we're just getting the bag from the uh, manufacturer 
and we infuse it to patient. That's it. We, we don't do anything to understand a little bit more, at least routinely, what's the quality of the product that we were infusing. And so I, I do think that there is a strong need to, to understand more and to, to, to get information of what we're infusing because, again, the only, the only readout that we have is a few months later checking if this patient have responded. And, and so there are limitations, right? Because if you think about it, we, in the, the clinical practice, uh, for example, you get the bag and um, the study that I show you from Andy Anderson, and that's also what we're doing, we're just rinsing the bag and getting some cells out of it um, and, and doing our sort of academic work. Um, but again, I think, you know, a, 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 we, we definitely need a quick and simple way to, to get a snapshot of, of the quality of the bag um, to start really correlating um, the quality of the bag with outcomes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is a question in the Q&A uh, room. Uh, uh, Corinne is asking, what do you know about the required duration of response for cure? And what parameters affect it most? No, that, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, we, we are sort of collecting now information about long-term outcomes. And it's interesting because, again, as I showed you, some diseases do show a plateau, which um, we love plateaus in general in oncology because that means that patients, after a while, stop relapsing. And you see that in lymphoma very nicely that about month six, I would say, you start having this plateau, meaning patients in general do not relapse. So for lymphoma, I think it's fair to say that if a patient is in complete remission for um, a year or two, that's it's a good indication that the likelihood of long-term response is high. I show you the 30% in the LBCL at five years. It's not very different to what we see at you know two years. So those patients maintain it. In other diseases, though, you still you keep having um, relapses. For example, in multiple myeloma, even the newest product, um, Siltacel, which is definitely very, very exciting, we're still not seeing a plateau. So for, for, for myeloma, it's really harder to say when a patient is cured. For ALL, which is the other big indication, um, I show you the, the, you know, the picture of Emily Whitehead. Well, I think at 10 years, I can say that she's likely cured, um, but many other kids unfortunately lapse so maybe a year or two later. So it's harder and uh, many physicians opt to get, give them an allogeneic transplant to give the highest chances for, for response. So again, it, it changes from uh, disease to disease, but I think uh, in most cases, if you have a few years of complete remission, that's really a, a good indicator that um, the response can be maintained. Mm. Again, if we had some biomarker for that, if we had some way to monitor for that, um, of course, it would be very, very uh, useful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There are two more questions in a row. Uh, Martin is asking, you show that non-responder cancer cells have low apoptotic gene expression. Could these cells, uh, these cancer cells be sensitized by changing the apoptotic balance with existing drugs. And if I can yeah. expand this question, like in general combination, no therapies uh, absolutely. attracting different. Absolutely, absolutely. Mechanisms. So stay tuned. We have a paper uh, under revision. I can't disclose too much, but um, in uh, I can disclose that in, that's in the same paper on Cancer Discovery 2020, we, um, we show that once we have sort of identify that pathway is important for resistance to CAR T-cell therapy, we use a pro-apoptotic drug called burinapan, or in general, they're called SMAC mimetics. So they enhance the, uh, the death receptor pathway. And at least in vitro, they, they do increase the likelihood of response of leukemic cells. Um, however, I, uh, and there are other papers out there, um, it's, when you combine a small molecule with CAR T cells, which is a live drug, you only you always need to be very very careful because 
again, the small molecule that you use can be toxic to your CAR T cells. And so in the example of this mimetics, they work very nicely in vitro at short term, but in the long run, they kill CAR T cell. Uh, they, they also induce apoptosis. So it's, it's a very fine balance that you need, we need to have to, to take advantage of those uh, pathway, but we think we think we we have found some some good strategy, and again, I hope that paper will be out soon. Mm -hmm. Another question uh, from David: What challenges exist in uh, using in vitro diagnosis medical devices in detecting the antigens in patients? In detecting antigens. antigens. Oh, okay. Yeah. So interestingly. Um, not all products need require, if you are referring to target, tumor targets, um, um, it's, it's an important point, right? Because um, from one side, we, we only want to treat patients that have expression of the antigen that we're targeting. It seems obvious, but it's not always really carefully checked. Uh, on the other side, we know that some treatment can affect the expression of those antigens. Um, and so, and therefore, potentially causing reduced activity of our car. So, um, if you are if you're thinking, how can we screen tumors for antigen expression before CAR T cells? I mean, it's essential, and it would be nice to have sort of uniform way to do that. Um, and the next generation of product that will be characterized by targeting antigens that are not expressed in all patients would definitely need that. Um, uh, the challenge is that you need to have a validated clinical grade system because you don't want to exclude patients that perhaps even with low expression could still respond. So, um, and this is for the tumor side. I don't know if you were referring also to the T cell side or just a more discovery, um, but this is what I would say for the tumor side. Thank you. Um, I would have another question because you are sitting at the unique position of being also a practitioner, medical doctor, and uh, in the forefront of uh, academic research. Um, how do you see the potential of um, having predictive signatures that you can also identify through these complex technologies uh, in the clinic? Like uh, considering the uh, costs of these therapies, what is the potential of having predictive signatures for therapy response or toxicities? Yeah, I mean, of course, that's, you know, that's a, uh, that's a goal that many of us have, right? Because as I show you in, in those curves, applying our signature in leukemic cells was able to differentiate patients that were having a very good outcome and patients that unfortunately did not. I'm not saying that we should use that signature in the clinic because we need to validate that, we need prospective studies. But the value per se of having a signature, either looking at the tumor cells or looking at the quality of the T cells and then say, this patient has this likelihood of making it, I think would be, it's really, really important to ensure the sustainability of this type of therapy. Um, we need to go from an era where we are treating patients just basically just based on, on the fact that they are eligible to an era where we are able to select the patient that will respond to patient that will not. And we're already doing that, by the way. We're already doing that in a sort of less sophisticated way by, for example, selecting patients with lower tumor burden, patients that don't have progressive disease. We're already doing that in the clinic because those are the patients that we know from clinical correlates are less likely, are more likely to respond. But then, of course, now, we need to get deeper and have more sophisticated ways to, to identify those patients. We don't have that now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is another question in the chat from John C. Uh, you mentioned the need for analysis pipelines for the protein data you are working with. What might be helpful? So the question is about uh, analysis pipeline, sure. Yeah, and the point, you know, the point I wanted to make is that uh, you guys have a lot of experience and certainly people in, in the audience have a lot of experience that when you get this data back, you can do pretty much what you, what you want with them, right? You can uh, um, apply this pipeline, the other pipeline focusing. And so having sort of a more unified and an unbiased way to approach the data and to report 
the results in a, again unbiased and uh, reliable and um, uniform way i think would be very very beneficial um, um, again if we if we're going to do prospective trials prospective analysis where we want to apply a certain signature a certain um, a certain biomarker to our patient we we need to make sure that we are analyzing not, not only we are sequencing and we are getting the raw data in the same way but also we are analyzing in in an uniform way yeah that's where skylight also tries to contribute uh, i see another question uh, thank you. Uh, Sukalp is saying thank you for your great talk. You mentioned that the population of exhausted T-cells associated with uh, treatment failure was not present in the CAR-T infusion product. Was there any differential expression signal in the infusion product itself which was correlated with outcome? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we are doing now the analysis of the infusion product in a larger scale, right? That that work was done in a few patients, so we were not really focused on looking at the at the products. But for that specific signature that we we looked at, it was not present in the product. So it was something that was developed after the CAR T cell came into contact with uh, um, leukemic cells that were sort of resistant to that, and so progressively they developed. Um, resistance. However, I've shown you the other paper, the one from MD Anderson that did show that there were specific clusters that were not reached in, um, in the non-responders. And so it's true. I mean, the, the point I think you're trying to make is that, um, or that I would like to make is that the infusion product is a, is a piece of the puzzle, right? So uh, we can find something from the infusion product, but it's not the only thing that will affect outcome. Um, other important points, as I try to really stress in my presentation, is the biopsy, the, the populations that are present in the biopsy. So, you know, in, my, in an ideal world, you would like to have single cell done in every single, um, in every uh, single um, uh, platform, in, in every single biopsy. Um, uh, but again, it's a good start to start from the product. Um, then, of course, I mean, the biopsies before CAR would be a, a nice, and the other thing would be nice to have the T-cells after infusion, because again, something can come up after you infuse them that you don't see at baseline. But again, it would be a stepwise process, right? As, as more the technology becomes available and the analysis become available, I think people will start to apply this uh, more and more. Mm -hmm. And I showed you the example of the lymphoma, right? You know, looking at the clusters, we would just say that, that those are all B cells and said only one cluster was the lymphoma and the other one was not. And we, I mean, I was thinking if we had that in the clinic, we really have a lot of diagnosis per se, independently of, of CAR T cell therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Sarah is asking, have you seen any evidence for different mechanisms or cell populations driving initial failure? To respond versus response versus relapse. Yeah, that that's that's an interesting question. So I don't have an answer in our cases right now. We're sort of interested in looking into that, and I'm sure we will find something. But the issue of non-responders is a very important issue, and and so we're very interested in sort of identify what could be the factors that drive that. And so I understand that uh, it will be beneficial to have more complex analysis of patients, including infusion products, microenvironment, clinical yeah. uh, factors to combine. And if you have a bigger, a better picture of a non-responder, you can choose the right mitigation measures then, I guess, to Perhaps increase the chance. You, with, the, with a very careful um, prospective studies to, to confirm those um, prediction models. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's the future, right? And that's the future of precision oncology. Yes, we are fighting for it as well. <laughs> thank you very much. If there are no more questions, um, I would like to thank the audience and uh, special thanks also to Marco for uh, this uh, webinar and very informative uh, summary of uh, these curative therapies now for so many patients. And let's hope that we can cure even more. We stop being scared of at least hematologic indications soon. <laughs>
Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye.